soon. Um, good afternoon and salam alaikum to everybody. Um, I think everybody in Bangladesh is thinking about the lockdown that will be starting just from tomorrow. Um, but the good news is that the lockdown won't prevent us from doing important, meaningful work, like the work that we will talk about today. Um, I believe I probably know many of you, but if, if there's anybody on the call that I don't know, my name is Tim Krupnik, and I am Simit's country representative in Bangladesh. And we're very pleased to have you join this call in which we are talking about um, actions to fight back against fall armyworm. Um, as part of a USAID supported project that is led by CIMIT that partners very closely with the Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Research Institute. And we're very pleased to have Dr. Hossein Nepal as our guest of honor, who will say a few words in a few moments to introduce the uh, seminar today. Um, we also partner closely with the Department of Agricultural Extension, uh, also with BIRI, um, and also very closely with colleagues at at Bari. In addition to that, our activities have close partnerships with the private sector and specifically work with Syngenta Bangladesh and also with Isfahani Agro Limited all around uh, take, doing research and training and capacity development. So one, uh, so farmers within Bangladesh and extension agents within ba Bangladesh are more empowered to respond to fall armyworm with integrated pest management solutions. And among those solutions and things that will be emerging are issues around host plant resistance. And so that is why we're proud to have on the call today, Dr. Prasanna Budapali, who is CIMIT's uh, Global Maize Program Director and the Director of the Maize CGI Research Program. And he will talk about advances around um, uh, the development of uh, fall armyworm resistant and tolerant cultivars in maize. But I won't say much more other than kindly request Dr. Hossein if you could please introduce the session today and then we will go to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, team. So, good afternoon, everyone. Actually, Bangladesh current situation, maize is promising growth, as we know, um, because uh, the food security contest or um, next time human consumption. So maize is becoming a very important role coming days in Bangladesh. So we need to protect maize in the coming days because Bangladesh soil, weather, farmers' perception is very mass favor to maize crop productions coming days. So anyway, we want to protect this crop and keep this increasing rate um, STD. So in this connection, so uh, present rates fall at V1. Government is uh, mass aware about on it. So as immediate appears uh, fall at V1, government, Bangladesh government, especially Ministry of Agriculture, from a uh, National Tax Force Committee um, with uh, 14 members. Recently, two additional members uh, joined uh, this uh, group. So we are now 16 members. So Ministry of Agriculture uh, with us, uh, USAID, CIMIT, FAO, Development of Agriculture Extension, um, <coughs> Research Institute, uh, Bari, Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, Bangladesh Rice Research Institute, also Bangladesh Agriculture Research Council, as well as Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Research Institute with this uh, group. So, followed me on recent time, initially it looks uh, devastating, but 
I must thank this team group of work. Uh, we anyway, we able to tackle. So far I can say we are able to tackle the uh, initial uh, <clears throat> um, stage we uh, tackle this. So um, that uh, follow me on group. I am also working as a um, member secretary of this group. So we are conducting um, a meeting every month, but the last uh, two, three months we are in irregular uh, due to COVID situation may hamper also um, our work. But anyway, we are uh, continuing our uh, close connection with this uh, group members. So in Bangladesh, uh, actually um, uh, follow me on activities, uh, national and international organizations are uh, with us. We are working with uh, private sectors awareness build up, monitoring, management things, we are working. So I think Dr. Fushun is one of the world leader on this subject matter. So I must thanks um, uh, Timothy G. Krupnik uh, selecting this uh, right man, right time in Bangladesh. I can say just a day before yesterday, our Honorable Agriculture Secretary um, visit my stations in uh, Dinaspur just Friday, and we are able to show him the fall and warm activities which is continuing in the field. Yes, he is much appreciated. As he knows many of this seminar, table talk, or other sources, but he observed his own eye and looks that difference that is our um, experiment continuation. And also the uh, world list, I can say the trap systems, its solar system, power scam, and uh, monitoring this uh, um, following me on activities, automatically data collection. Yes, it's, uh, he is very impressed uh, looking these things. Uh, he appreciated also, um, I can say <laughs> see it. Uh, to support this kind of works. So um, I can say, as Prashanna is one of the experts in this line, I think uh, today's uh, presentations, of course, it will be in this our knowledge, the group, uh, uh, major group, uh, were joining uh, with us, already is connected. Um, so I must thanks in advance, um, uh, Dr. Prashanna, um, uh, he arranged his time with us. So maybe next time I will talk another side. So, okay, Dr. Foshan, no. Thank uh, you. Go ahead with your subject matter. Uh, I think we will be in this knowledge on uh, following me on activities. Okay, please go Thank ahead. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, I hope you are able to see my screen. It looks good. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, my sincere thanks to uh, the DG BWMRA, Dr. Israel Hussein, for the very kind words uh, and for an excellent introduction to the topic. And uh, Tim Krupnik and the whole Bangladesh team, uh, several of the colleagues are very, very well known to me uh, for joining this discussion. Um, I must also thank at the outset USAID, which has been uh, steadfastly supporting uh, the initiative, not only at the global level by CIMIT uh, through our work in Africa and in Asia, as well as uh, in Bangladesh through the specific project which team uh, is implementing with partners. Um, I must also thank FAO. Uh, uh, Dr. Noor Kondakar is also here. Uh, I play uh, as a member, serve as a member uh, of the FAO's Technical Steering Committee on Fala Miwam and chair the uh, Technical Working Group on Host Plant Resistance. Uh, a few days back, perhaps a week back, uh, we had um, a seminar organized by the FAO Global Headquarters on Host Plant Resistance. Uh, so a very strong 
uh, relationship uh, and continued collaboration between uh, FAO and CIMIT on diverse aspects, uh, including host plant resistance. So Tim gave me this topic on fighting back against falamium. Uh, what are the advances in terms of host plant resistance? Um, I will be focusing mostly on maize uh, because maize is the crop in which a lot of work has been done on native genetic resistance to falamium as well as on the transgenic resistance. So I will come mostly on maize, but there are a few efforts also going on in sorghum, uh, but not at reached the stage uh, where we can present the results. Uh, as we all are aware that falamium is now a global problem. Uh, till 2016, uh, it was confined only to the Americas. And uh, since 2016, uh, ever since it was reported from West Africa, uh, it has spread very rapidly to various countries across Africa. And most recently uh, in the Northern part of Africa too, in 2019 and 2020. And uh, so more than 40 countries right now across Africa showing prevalence of falamivam. And uh, we are all aware that falamivam uh, appeared first in May, 2018. Uh, in Karnataka, in India. And since then, uh, several countries across Asia and the uh, Oceania have reported falamivam incidents. And 2020, February, uh, Australia was the one to report it in Queensland region. So now it's indeed a, a global problem. It's almost impossible to eradicate this pest. And we do need to successfully and sustainably manage the pest uh, through an integrated pest management manner. Uh, this should include various elements, including scouting and surveillance on which uh, Bangladesh has done tremendous work. I'm extremely proud of the way Bangladesh as a country responded to Falamivam, not only reactively, but also in a very proactive manner, uh, setting up the traps in the border areas with India and monitoring the situation very closely and educating the farming communities, educating the extension agencies about the pest, uh, setting up a very functional, uh, what we call surveillance network. Uh, I think on various fronts, Bangladesh really demonstrated uh, an excellent competence in terms of tackling the challenge of falamivam. And uh, that has uh, uh, what we call showed excellent results as uh, Dr. Hussein pointed out that uh, the impact now uh, is much lesser than what we have seen in the earlier years. Despite that, there can be no scope for complacency. We need uh, effective, affordable, and sustainable technologies to be uh, developed, validated, scaled up, and deployed uh, to the farming communities um, because there is no way you can eliminate the pest. And therefore, this requires host plant resistance agroecological management, environmentally safer pesticides, biological control, and all this integrated through effective policies uh, and regulation. Uh, this is the crux of integrated pest management, reducing our reliance on synthetic pesticides and promoting environmentally and ecologically friendly options uh, so that farmers can sustainably manage the pest. With regard to host plant resistance, uh, this is undoubtedly one of the key pillars of integrated pest management. In fact, many consider it as a foundation on which other elements of integrated pest management can be very effectively uh, what we call integrated. Uh, native, there are two types of host plant resistance. One is the native genetic resistance, where we typically identify and utilize crop germplasm with resistance to a particular insect pest, like for example, falamivam. Uh, transgenic resistance, on the other hand, relies on exogenous uh, sources of resistance. Uh, that means other than the recipient plant to make the host plant resistant to the insect pest. The effectiveness of strategies, whether you employ uh, native genetic resistance or transgenic resistance depends upon uh, several factors. One, uh, you need to have a strong diversity of germplasm. Uh, secondly, you do need to have an effective germplasm 
screening strategy. And that screening strategy revolves around uh, having an efficient uh, insect rearing technique or mass rearing technique uh, and capacity to artificially infest uh, thousands of entries every year and unravel the genetic variation in the germplasm. And then finally, what breeding technologies you employ for introgressing the known sources of resistance or validated sources of resistance into diversity of the germplasm that you have and develop cultivars that can be uh, used by the farming communities. So these four areas are very, very critical for having a successful breeding strategy against uh, insect pests, especially. Uh, breeding for insect resistance in maize uh, is not very new. At, at CIMIT, this has been in, uh, in practice since more than four decades. Um, there are excellent publications that came out, especially in the 1990s. Uh, one amongst them is the insect resistant maize. It's a proceedings of an international symposium that was held at uh, CIMIT in Mexico and edited by John Mim, uh, one of uh, CIMIT's entomologists who did commendable work on, on uh, breeding for native genetic resistance, not just to fall amivam, but for various insect pests, including stem borers, as well as the post-harvest insect pests. So those colleagues who are interested in breeding must read these open access publications uh, that are available in the CIMIT repository. Uh, one is the towards insect resistant maize for the third world, and the other one is the insect resistant maize recent advances and utilization. Fortunately, uh, maize is such a crop where you have tremendous diversity in the germplasm and offering sources of uh, resistance to an array of diseases and insect pests. Um, Summit breeders and entomologists uh, working through the 1970s and 80s and 90s identified several land races, uh, especially the Cuban germplasm or the Caribbean flints, uh, besides the taxpenos in Mexico. And both these sources are excellent for offering resistance to different insect pests, including stem borers and fala miwam. So populations were formulated in 1970s by combining these various sources of resistance. And there are two such populations synthesized. One is what we call multiple insect resistance tropical, and another is multiple borer resistant populations. Both these populations are really invaluable in terms of developing uh, germplasm for resistance to various insect pests, including fala miwam. And this germplasm also formed the base for USDA at Mississippi, at the University of Florida, as well as at Embrapa, Brazil, to initiate similar efforts on breeding for native genetic resistance to fala miwam. So Simit's germplasm, especially the land races and these populations uh, served as excellent foundation for initiating temperate maize germplasm breeding for fala miwam resistance. So here is John Mim uh, when he was working in 1980s and 90s on, uh, on fala miwam and other pests. And in a publication in, in 1984, uh, John Mim writes that we concentrate on attempting to identify and use more stable resistance to larval feeding of the antibiosis, strong non-preference or plant tolerance mechanisms in the order of priority. And as expressed in a no choice situation under field conditions. So in one sentence, John Mim actually summarized the strategy for breeding for insect resistance. That means focusing on, on artificial infestation under no choice situation and so that you can very clearly dissect the differences among the genotypes. Uh, incidentally uh, and unfortunately, John Mim passed away uh, nearly two years back. Uh, uh, so that was a big loss and he would have been very proud now to see the kind of work that we have done using some of his germplasm as well as some of our own newly developed germplasm from Africa. 
similarly, the Paul Williams team at uh, uh, at uh, USDA ARS Corn Host Plant Assistance Research Unit at Mississippi, uh, they have again a long history of conducting research on native genetic resistance all amoebae, especially in the temperate maize germplasm. CIMIT focused on tropical and subtropical germplasm, and uh, USDA Mississippi focused on temperate genetic backgrounds. And during the 80s and 90s, both the institutions collaborated extensively and exchanged the germplasm, uh, which offered resistance to the pest. Uh, several important lines have been developed, temperate maize and bread lines like MP705, MP708, 713, 714, 716, uh, which offer resistance to fall amoebae. But remember, these are not in tropical genetic background. Uh, these are in temperate genetic background. So they can be potentially serving as trade donors, uh, but they cannot be directly utilized uh, in constituting improved hybrids under tropical uh, conditions. So in, in 2017, uh, thanks to USAID's uh, project we had, uh, which I continue to lead, we could establish a greenhouse facility. And at Kibako, uh, which is our major experimental center in Kenya, about three hours drive from Nairobi, one of the most beautiful experimental stations you can ever come across on, on maize, including a fantastic double haploid facility there. So we have 13 such greenhouses, not just one or two, but 13 greenhouses each greenhouse almost half an acre in size and the capacity to screen uh, hundreds of entries uh, in each of the greenhouses uh, against artificial infestation of the pest. So that is the key. When you do this massive germplasm screening, we can't do it in the normal open field conditions. We need to establish strong greenhouse greenhouses where we can uh, where we can infest the plants artificially and uh, make it grow until harvest and then record the data and use the data in uh, identifying promising germplasm. So we are uh, establishing similar facilities at Harare in Zimbabwe, uh, as well as uh, to a limited extent at Hyderabad in India. And I strongly suggest Bangladesh uh, Maize and Wheat Research Institute also to set up uh, at least two or three such greenhouses uh, so that germplasm can be introduced from various sources, uh, especially from CIMIT, uh, screened and uh, validated against fall amoebae populations. And you can build a very strong breeding program for developing uh, native genetic resistant uh, maize varieties with fall amoebae resistance. So more than 6,000 Simit maize germplasm entries have been screened so far against fall amoebae under artificial infestation uh, between 2017 and 2020. So this is, uh, I would say, one of the unique facilities you will see anywhere in the world. I don't think any other institution has such a massive screenhouse complex uh, to, uh, to screen against uh, a particular insect pest like fall amoebae. And uh, even at Mississippi, they don't have, they do it normally under open field conditions, uh, but not under such a uh, huge greenhouse network. The second most important thing is to have a well-developed economical protocol for mass rearing of neonate larvae uh, of the fall armyworm so that these neonates can be used for artificially infesting the maize plants. Uh, the protocol for this, we have already presented it in the Fall Amiwam IPM manual for Africa, which is open source. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Uh, and this is jointly released by uh, CIMIT and USAID and with a number of experts across the world uh, contributing to various chapters, uh, including the one that I developed on uh, host plant resistance. So CIMIT Calro team, Calro is the national partner in Kenya, Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization. We optimized the mass rearing protocol at uh, the insectary at Katumani in Kenya, which is not more than one hour drive from Kibako. And the center has a capacity to supply almost uh, half a million to 800,000 neonates per year. 
and these are in turn used for germplasm screening experiments under artificial infestation uh, at Kibako in Kenya by our entomology team. And uh, at what stage we do? Uh, typically, this is done uh, early in the morning, 7 to 9 a.m. preferably, or in the evenings, 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, to allow the neonates to acclimatize to the environment. Uh, if you expose these neonates to too harsh conditions, too hot conditions, uh, they may desiccate and they may not be very effective. The infestation protocol may not be succeeding. So you have to be careful at the right time for infestation. Secondly, uh, inbred lines and hybrids, uh, they cannot be same stage at which we do uh, the infestation. In case of Inbred lines, we do it at the V5 stage. And in case of uh, hybrids, we do it at V3 stage because hybrids are more uh, vigorous and they can they tolerate this infestation and the pressure much better than the inbred lines. And this, uh, this is important. And again, the load that we give on inbred lines is slightly lesser compared to the load that we, the neonate load that we put it on the hybrid plants. But practically each and every plant receives this neonate larvae uh, in the world. Uh, and then these populations then keep on multiplying within the screen house. The second one is uh, not only the infestation protocol, but also this germplasm rating protocol. And that rating is done at weekly intervals, starting with the two weeks after infestation. And then we record at every week. Uh, at least for three to four stay, uh, weeks, we keep recording the, the, the foliar damage ratings. So you can see here, uh, this is done on a Davis scale. Davis is uh, an entomologist who worked with, uh, with Paul Williams. Uh, and uh, Davis and Williams devised this rating. And the details of what these ratings are, are presented in the Fala Mivam IPM manual. So, that one means almost absolutely no visible symptoms, maybe a few pinholes here and there, but other than that, you don't see any major infestation symptoms. Uh, but nine means almost the plant is dead because the oral is very severely damaged. So on a one to nine scale, the foliar damage rating is taken on a plot by plot basis uh, in, in the screen houses. And when we harvest the plants, uh, then we also record the year, um, the years, how are the years looking? And you can see here again, the score one means absolutely no damage and score nine means the entire year uh, is almost eaten away by the, the fala mivam larvae. Remember the fall larvae can bore through the husk and can damage the developing year uh, if, the, if, the, if the variety is uh, susceptible. So not only foliar damage, therefore, but ear damage rating also has to be done on a plot by plot basis uh, on a one to nine Davis scale. Then the third most important thing is what are the thresholds that we employ to either advance the materials or to reject a, a plot further. So we do, we take a combination of various traits. Uh, foliar damage has to be less than five. Ear damage has to be certainly less than three on a one to nine scale, one being highly resistant and nine being almost dead or completely devastated. And in addition to these two scores, we also record grain yield under artificial infestation under two different types of experiments, choice experiments and no choice experiments. Choice experiments means we are evaluating multiple entries within the same screenhouse. Okay, maybe there are four rows each or two rows each, but there are multiple entries. So insect has a choice, uh, whether to feed on a particular genotype or to move from one genotype to another genotype, which if, if it doesn't like one particular entry. So that is a choice. And a no choice means an entire screen house, we have nothing but one particular entry, uh, or we have compartments within the screen house. And so that at least uh, 30 to 40 rows of an entry can be uh, grown uh, within that screenhouse compartment and artificial infestated. Then there is absolutely no question of insect moving from one genotype to another genotype. Either it has to survive or it has to perish. 
So that is what we call as no choice experiment. In addition to these three, we also have to look at other key traits that are relevant for our farming communities. That's why breeding for insect resistance is not an easy job. It's not about just having a fall armyworm tolerant variety. That particular variety also needs to have higher yield. It needs to have other traits that are, for example, drought tolerance in case of uh, Kenya or Africa, uh, low nitrogen tolerance, resistance to tarsicum leaf blight, gray leaf spot, resistant to ear rots, uh, good husk cover, uh, plant height, ear height, ear aspects, uh, percentage lodging. So there are a number of traits that we have, which are must have traits. So any genotype that we are advancing from one stage to another stage, they need to fulfill those key traits that are important in the product portfolio. So looking at all these criteria, you select hybrids. You don't select hybrids only on the basis of follow me warm, uh, rating or, uh, or grain yield, but all these conditions. So in a typical choice experiments, where there are multiple entries that are being screened in screen houses, you can see here how the inbred lines are performing. A CML 71, uh, almost a clean entry, an excellent entry. It has also proved highly resistant in India uh, when the local uh, institution, Indian stuff, maize research screened it compared to 395, a very elite line, drought tolerant line used in several commercial hybrid maize combinations in Africa, but highly susceptible to fall on Iwam. Under artificial infestation, you can see this. Uh, similarly, CML338, you can see the typical plant color, uh, which differentiates CML338. Uh, very clean genotype uh, with uh, no effect much of the fall on Iwam compared to CML444, another very prominently used line, drought tolerant line developed in Zimbabwe and highly susceptible. Similarly, you can see CML444 here and CML574 here side by side, all plants infested, each and every plant. So these are excellent set of inbred lines and uh, BMWRI can get these lines if they have not already received them and start using them in the breeding programs uh, in terms of uh, as trade donors. Some of them could be white kernel lines, some of them are yellow kernel lines, but it doesn't matter. In breeding, we can very quickly in progress such sources of resistance uh, in the breeding programs. The next one is to screen hybrids, not just inbred lines, but ultimately we have to develop and provide hybrids to the farming communities. And you can see here uh, the compartmentalized screen houses with the no choice experiments undertaken. So these are two different follow me warm tolerant hybrids. Uh, very clean with excellent ear formation compared to uh, a susceptible benchmark hybrids that are grown in Eastern Africa, almost devastated. Uh, ears may be formed but highly affected by uh, the conditions, the defoliation and effect of on the photosynthetic rate. So this is how typically you can see the no choice experiments, how the tolerant hybrids perform compared to the susceptible hybrids. And this is a, a quick summary we released. We identified three different fall warm tolerant hybrids in 2020, uh, one, two, three are the series here compared to two different checks. DK777 is from Bayer, Monsanto, and WE3106 is our internal genetic gain check, but which is also commercialized in several countries across Africa. And you can see here under no choice experiments, the difference is absolutely so clear. Uh, seven to almost eight tons per hectare uh, in this follow me warm tolerant hybrids compared to not more than one ton per hectare under severe infestation, as you can see. The foliar damage ratings, as, as I talked about, ear damage less than three, cob exit holes, anthesis dates. This means that we are comparing hybrids which are very similar in terms of maturity groups, uh, not very different ones. Then bad husk cover, 
uh, has to be less than 10%. Ear rots under such conditions have to be less, but here you can see ear rot uh, percentage going up because of uh, the damage due to fall amoeba and uh, things like that. So this kind of summary very quickly tells you uh, what is the basis for identification of these hybrids uh, against benchmark commercial hybrids uh, in Kenya under no choice experiments. We also then took these hybrids and extensively evaluated them under on-farm trials uh, at uh, several locations, dozens of locations in Kenya. And again, you can see the difference between a tolerant hybrid versus susceptible hybrid under farmer's management conditions uh, in, in the field. <clears throat> and uh, that's how on December two, uh, 23rd in 2020, we released through a public announcement, these three hybrids <clears throat> for uh, public and private sector partners across Africa. And these are, uh, you can see here, the clean harvest with no damage to the ears compared to uh, a susceptible hybrid. We have several benchmark hybrids evaluated. You can see all the black spots here means that the falamibum has caused damage to the ears. And this is again an entry point for mycotoxin causing fungi uh, to, to further cause problems. So it's not just eating and reduction in grain yield, but providing entry points to mycotoxin causing fungi that makes uh, Falami worm infestation all the more bad. Uh, right now, there are national performance trials uh, that are happening in several countries across Africa for these three hybrids uh, nominated by the respective key national partners in Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, South Sudan, Angola, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, Ghana, uh, and Burkina Faso also have showed exp expressed interest and we'll be sending them these materials. So by 2021 ending or latest by first quarter of 2022, we can expect uh, uh, if not all the three hybrids, maybe one or two hybrids uh, in each of these countries released. And that's a big thing. Uh, the next step is to commercialize them. Uh, and that's what we are going to do in a non-exclusive manner through several seed companies, and those will be jointly licensed to partners. Um, these are white maize hybrids. If any of the Asian countries are interested to commercialize white maize hybrids with falami worm tolerance, uh, we can do testing uh, of these hybrids in those countries and see how they perform, what kind of yield levels they show, what kind of uh, protection from falami worm damage they can offer, and then move forward with uh, releases. But remember, these are white maize hybrids. But as I said before, we have yellow maize in breadlines too with the native genetic resistance to falami worm. And some of the CMLs are yellow lines, yellow kernel lines. So there is nothing that should prevent either white or yellow kernel inbred lines to be used in breeding programs if we want to introgress resistance. If we want to directly deploy these hybrids the option is open, especially where there is a demand for white maize kernel hybrids uh, in, uh, in different countries. Coming to the plant's resistance to insects, uh, the question may come up, like what exactly are we seeing? How are these native genetic resistance traits manifested? So as a painter in 1950s uh, very eloquently highlighted, insect resistance in plants is primarily either because of non-preference, which was later called anti-xenosis by some entomologists, or antibiosis. So in anti-xenosis or non-preference, it's about how much damage or how many herbivores a plant attracts. So it is, you can typically measure anti-xenosis um, in terms of herbivore presence, number of eggs or larvae or adults that are surviving in the particular entry, versus herbivore damage, especially percentage leaf area affected or foliar damage and ear damage scores and things like that. In case of antibiosis, it's about how suitable the plant is for the herbivore. Uh, 
this means herbivore fitness or performance has to be measured. The fertility rate or larval development time, intrinsic plant traits, whether it is chemical or physical that are underlying that fitness against herbivore. So these are, uh, if you have to typically go deeper into what exactly are the mechanisms behind uh, resistance offered, native genetic resistance offered by the cement materials, we need to explore that. That's what we are doing presently at Kenya and also in collaboration with IRDC in uh, France to understand the metabolite differences uh, in the Falami worm uh, resistant lines versus susceptible lines. And also understanding what kind of fertility rate or larval development rate uh, is um, manifested when we use the resistant lines versus susceptible lines. So in essence, do we know comprehensively about the mechanisms behind native genetic resistance to fall on me one? Not fully, uh, but there are various studies done on cement lines, on Mississippi lines that show how various characteristics, including the morphological characteristics like presence of trichomes, surface waxes, strong husk coverage, or tightness of the husk, uh, chemical factors like alkaloids, phenolics, flavonoids, terpenoids, silk mason, or the level of plant nutrition, how they can influence the resistance has been very well analyzed. Uh, I give here two such examples. One is physiological, nutritional, and biochemical basis of corn resistance to foliage feeding, uh, Fala Miwam, a paper published in 2009. And another one is implication of a, a, a terpenoid called karyophyllin. How this karyophyllin is produced typically uh, in a maize line resistant to herbivory, especially Fala uh, compared to uh, a susceptible line. So we begin to understand uh, what are the factors behind uh, either anti-xenosis or antibiosis. Uh, but the different lines may even show uh, different types of resistance. And what is therefore important to understand is there is no single mechanism that underlies uh, resistance, native genetic resistance to Fala Miwam. It is typically polygenic. It is not a, a BT kind of a toxin uh, coded by a single gene or a double stack, but it is typically polygenic. That means many genes are involved in metabolic pathways that lead to manifestation of native genetic resistance. To understand this better, we also need to do genomic analysis. And that's what has been done uh, by, by the Mississippi group uh, recently. And it led to the identification of uh, two major QTL, uh, one on chromosome four, another on chromosome nine, uh, especially at the bins 4.06. Bins are small segments of the chromosomes, uh, which are typically around 20 megabases in size. And uh, these two QTL, together explained almost 36% of phenotypic variants over multiple environments. So the QTL at bin 9.03 uh, indeed co-locates with a previously identified QTL uh, that controls resistance to leaf feeding damage, not only by fa, uh, fala miwam, but also by other lepidopteran insects. So there are obviously two major candidate genomic regions that need to be further explored. And our team in Africa undertook a genome-wide association study, uh, as well as a joint linkage mapping and association mapping experiment on a set of 285 inbred lines coupled with 485 double haploid lines. So this is a huge, uh, huge experimental material, almost uh, uh, 760, uh, 70 lines. And, uh, and develop these, these lines, the DH lines, are developed from seven Fala Miwam tolerant lines in various combinations. So we detected seven single nucleotide polymorphisms on four, five, seven, eight, and nine. Again, you can see here, four and nine are repeated. And uh, that's why we are going to further validate the explore, what is the significance of this chromosome uh, four and nine on Fala Miwam native genetic resistance. So genomic prediction, is also another possibility for improving native genetic resistance to fala miwam. That means genome-wide selection uh, and followed by prediction. 
shifting on from native genetic resistance to transgenic resistance. Uh, the Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt-based maize uh, germplasm has been extensively deployed in US, in Brazil, in several countries in South America and North America against Fala Migwam for many years. And several of them have been also defeated by the insect over a period of three years to six years from release. And some are still uh, surviving, which have been uh, deployed in the recent years, in the last four to five years, like Viptera, for example, uh, is an excellent BT event. Uh, it's, uh, it's working extremely well, uh, which I saw in Brazil. Uh, so there are, there are uh, successful stories. None of these countries, especially US or Brazil, got any way majorly hit by Fala Mibam uh, because of continuous deployment of BT maize. That's a fact. So US still grows around 40 million hectares of maize and continues to be the leading producer and leading exporter of maize. Uh, so is the case with Brazil. Uh, so therefore, there is absolutely no doubt that BT maize has been successful uh, for several years. But the only important fact to remember here is that there are several BT events that have been defeated by the pest, the insect developing resistance against them, and new BT events had to be developed and deployed. In Asia, uh, BT maize is presently grown only in two countries, uh, especially Philippines, uh, almost six, 660,000 hectares of yellow maize, and Vietnam, more than 100,000 hectares, uh, in 2020, these were primarily developed against corn borers, uh, but secondary target pests include fall armyworm, cutworm, and earworm. Uh, BT maize events have also been recently approved in Pakistan, but yet to be commercialized. They are being validated. BT maize events are also under testing and approval processes uh, presently in both China as well as Indonesia. That's the status with regard to BT maize, and uh, you can see many players, Bayer, Syngenta, Corteva especially, uh, they are marketing a variety of BT maize events, including the simple ones like Monet 10, uh, or which is Cry1 AB based, or TC1507, which is Cry1 F based, but these are going to be defeated very soon, or they are already less effective against fall amoeba. But what are really powerful here is Monet 9034, which is uh, being deployed in case of uh, Vietnam, as well as in Philippines, or this VIP3A from Syngenta, uh, which are doing extremely well. So you can see here in some cases, it's a, it's a double stack plus another VIP3A, so MIR162 and Monet 9034. These are extremely good, Egrisur Viptera, or power core. Uh, this is the third generation BT maize event. This is the first generation. This is the second generation. And now we have even third generation BT maize events marketed by Bayer, Syngenta, and Corteva. Uh, and uh, the efficacy and benefits of this have been published in, in Brazil, in uh, Vietnam, in South Africa. So there is absolutely no doubt about the efficacy of these events. In fact, uh, Vietnam also published a report on the impact of using GM maize uh, in Vietnam, especially also highlighting its uh, resistance to fall amoeba. But two things are extremely important. If BT maize has to be successfully deployed uh, and sustainably managed in Asia, uh, we are required to implement a robust insect resistance man management strategy and together with product stewardship and preventing or mitigating the onset of resistance to fall amoeba populations to insecticides, whether it is synthetic insecticides or BT insecticides requires a strong insect resistance management strategy. We also need to better understand the fall amoeba population dynamics and the resistance profiles across the region, uh, not only in countries like China, uh, but also uh, we need to do this in South Asia, in Bangladesh, in India, in Nepal, uh, in Pakistan, and uh, over a period of time, and that will help us guide the present and future Falami worm response strategies. 
there are already very strong reports from China that show uh, far new falamimum populations with resistance to synthetic insecticides as well as some of the BT events emerging. So this therefore requires a well-coordinated and joint actions by the industry, by the academia, farmers, and government agencies. It cannot be done alone by the industry or alone by academia. It has to be a confluence of all the players that are involved in this. But one final message that I would like to give irrespective of whether countries are going to deploy or not deploy BT maize, native genetic resistance varieties are indeed a reality as we demonstrated very powerfully in Africa. And there is no reason why we can't do this in Asia. And even when BT maize events are deployed in some countries like in Philippines or in Vietnam, there is an extremely important reason why we need to deploy these BT events in conventional or native genetic resistant background. You look at this, the BT maize events may show on a one to nine scale, one or two, that's because they are mostly single gene events, some case says dual gene events, and they exert a high selection pressure on the insect, and therefore insect tend to break this down very quickly. On the other hand, the native genetic resistant varieties are typically between 2.5 to 5. And these are, as I said, polygenic in nature. They exert low selection pressure on the insect because they do not produce an extremely resistant phenotype. They are mostly partially resistant. We can see still some damage, but the damage is not going to yield significant yield. On the other hand, most of the commercial maize varieties in Africa and Asia fall in this category, somewhere between six to nine. So there is a reason to replace them with new varieties having native genetic resistance. And if you have to deploy BT maize, you better put this in native genetic resistant backgrounds and therefore combine a single gene or a dual stack BT mode of action with a polygenic native genetic resistance rather than simply putting this BT event in a commercial susceptible genetic background. So in conclusion, friends, post-plant resistance to Fala Mivam should indeed form the foundation upon which other components of integrated pest management can be very effectively built. And there is absolutely no doubt that this could achieve, we can achieve synergies between host plant resistance with biological control, with chemical, con with cultural control, and with uh, chemical control, especially using environmentally safer pesticides, whether they are synthetic pesticides or biopesticides. And that is the solution for sustainable management of falamivam by the smallholders. And both conventionally resistant varieties as well as transgenic varieties have their own place in falamivam management. And uh, there are exciting opportunities now for Asia to use this germplasm that we have developed and validated in Africa, uh, in either in yellow or in white backgrounds and deploy them uh, as sources of resistance uh, or directly as such these hybrids in targeted agroecologies in South Asia, including Bangladesh. So I'll be very, very happy to collaborate with the team, especially with BW MRI on uh, breeding for native genetic resistance to follow me warm. And this is an area which I fervently wish the funding agencies like USAID, uh, as well as uh, FAO uh, need to promote very strongly uh, in terms of achieving sustainable control uh, to this pest. Uh, I really thank uh, the global partners on follow me warm research and development, the funding agencies, especially USAID Feed the Future program, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the CRP Maze Window 1, Window 2 donors, and several colleagues from Africa, uh, my entomologist Bruce Anani, uh, breeders Yosef Bien, Dan Makumbi, um, seed system specialist Mosisa Worku, and the molecular geneticist Manja Gauda. Uh, they are all contributing tremendously uh, to this very intensive mission uh, of developing and deploying uh, varieties, improved maize varieties uh, with several traits that are relevant for smallholders, including falamivam resistance. 
Thank you so much for your patient hearing and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Was still muted. Thank you, Doc, uh, Dr. Prasanna, very, very much. We have a number of questions. Thank you, team. Yeah. PM Prasanna, thank you very much for your nice presentation. And we see some hope there that some may raise on nice. And I don't know what is the difference between the color one in the in case of nutritional values. Side by side, host plant resistance. Do you have any plan to res uh, resist insect that is polar mealworm using Casper Cas9 or like this mm. in future? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, in terms of color, or, uh, color the yellow maize is preferred, is usually used for the poultry industry. And in some cases, of course, in India uh, and in many other countries, yellow maize is also used for human consumption, either as a fresh corn or as a flour and makyaka roti with sarsonka sag is a very popular <laughs> dish in uh, India. So yellow maize is used for both purposes, human consumption as well as, uh, but mostly for the poultry feed. Uh, but the orange maize, there is another one which we developed with uh, high pro-vitamin A content. And uh, that is uh, not all yellow maize has got high levels of pro-vitamin A. Uh, the orange maize, which we typically develop uh, in Africa, uh, have high pro-vitamin A content. So in terms of color, that's the difference, uh, but practically you can in progress resistance from any of the sources that I talked into, uh, either into a white maize germplasm base or yellow maize or orange maize base. The second question is with regard to CRISPR-Cas genome editing. Uh, I don't think native genetic resistance to fall armyworm can be achieved through gene editing because there is no single gene or the two or three genes that play a major role in resistance. Here, it's mostly polygenic resistance. That means multiple genes are involved. When multiple genes are involved in the manifestation of a trait, uh, undertaking CRISPR-Cas means that you need to know not only what specific gene is there, which has a huge contribution to phenotypic variants, but what exactly is the polymorphism within that gene which we need to change in order to convert an unfavorable allele into a favorable allele. And that process needs to be repeated at multiple genes across the chromosomes, which is a much, much more tougher task compared to cases where you have one or two genes which play a major role uh, in manifestation of it, right? So to me, native genetic resistance has to be achieved either through conventional breeding, like what we did so far, uh, and that too in a very rapid manner. Uh, remember, within three years, we have uh, new hybrids developed and released because of a very strong germplasm base. Uh, so it's not an uh, ineffective process. It's very effective. And uh, within a few years, perhaps we may also have marker-assisted breeding possible for transfer of resistance very quickly into different genetic backgrounds. That is possible, but not CRISPR-Cas-based genome editing. I hope I answered your question, Dr. Hart. Thank you. Are there other, Thank you very much. other direct questions that anyone would like to pose? If so, not- Yeah, the, I, could, I could very quickly answer some of the questions on the chat box. Uh, okay, what percentage of FAW will reduce if we introduce FAW tolerant or resistant varieties? You see the, the Introduction of resistant or tolerant varieties is not for reducing the populations. Uh, populations uh, cannot be eradicated or minimized by host plant resistance, but you can minimize the damage caused by uh, uh, what we call if insect population in a farmer's field. For example, as I showed, the difference between a tolerant hybrid or a resistant hybrid 
versus susceptible hybrid is almost six tons per hectare. Seven or eight tons in tolerant hybrid versus 0 0.9 to one ton per hectare. That is a huge difference. So that means you are protecting the yield, which is the most important thing here. Uh, how long the commercialization process take time uh, in the market in African experience? In typically in Africa right now, we are, we are going through a fast track release process uh, by talking to the regulatory agencies. Otherwise, normally it takes two years to conduct NPTs. But because fall armyworms is such a major issue right now, and uh, the farmers are still applying a lot of environmentally toxic pesticides. So we are discussing with the regulatory agencies how to expedite the varietal. This is similar to the, the vaccine release. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In what, can, what could take uh, uh, several, several years to release, uh, governments have been able to achieve within such a short time. And several regulatory agencies in Africa uh, are, uh, are right now very, very encouraging towards that. And we will be able to release, at least in some countries by the end of this year. We are only scaling up the number of locations, uh, but large scale demonstrations or trials across the major maize growing ecologies in each country and demonstrating the potential benefit. Uh, so I wish in Asia too, we can come up with that kind of uh, uh, solution. What is the possible risk of resistance uh, not maintained? How quickly these lines can get susceptible? In case of native genetic resistance, uh, unlike uh, like brown plant hopper resistance, which there are several biotypes and major genes which are playing resistance against each of the biotypes or in the case of wheat rust, this is not the case of one gene conferring resistance to one particular biotype. Here it is a polygenic mode of resistance, Mahesh. So uh, I don't expect the resistance to be broken down uh, in case of Fala Mivam. That is the advantage of polygenic resistance compared to single gene or two gene based resistance. Is there any transgenic res resistant other than uh, BT? No. Uh, all the ones are either cry-based proteins or crystal uh, delta endotoxins or uh, VIP3A, that is vegetative insecticidal protein. And in both cases, these are synthesized by Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, so these are all BT in broader term. These are still, they still fall under BT. No other uh, different mode of action other than either cry-based or uh, VIP3A based have been identified so far. Okay, I think I answered questions that are there in the chat box. If there are anything additional, please feel free to open up your microphone and ask. Any specific questions? Actually, no questions. I always prefer extending my research facilities. Uh, as I worked uh, last two days, consult with my maize scientist. <laughs> Actually, last three years, we received uh, some good materials from Africa by yeah. this time. Yeah. Uh, that materials, uh, we start evaluation in our field. Yes, uh, there is a, there are encouraging result. Excellent. And by this time, as you mentioned that CM71. Yes. yes it is good. It, it is good. By this time, he called my uh, maze breeder to come to my room. I consult <laughs> by this time. Yes, uh, with this uh, with this result, yeah, he showed me this, uh, this result. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad that you validated yeah. in uh, BMWR. <laughs> I'm very, yes. very happy. So, yes, uh, from your um, presentation, I am impressed. Though I am not the, um, uh, it is not my <laughs> uh, background, but uh, I, I learned many things. I am interested in um, BT-based zanplasm that in Philippines, Vietnam already uh, some screening result is there, but uh, BT maize is still uh, Bangladesh is not considered seriously, but uh, as uh, 
in Kupnik is uh, with um, us, um, he can initiate it. Um, a few weeks before, I consult with some ministerial person about it, but uh, they suggest uh, it is not easy <laughs> as a, a ministry of environment is uh, closely associated with these things. But at least uh, we can raise a hand to ministry, but uh, through civic support. Yeah. So I think this is a very, very important point, Dr. Hussein. And uh, yes. undoubtedly, we do need to get access to these big events through the private sector, through the technology providers yes. like, uh, like either Bayer or Syngenta or Corteva. Either of these three players, uh, we, we need to have partnership. And that can be only possible when the government expresses interest, and invites these uh, institutions, these three technology providers, any of them, uh, to partner with the government. And I'm sure they'll be very happy to do that. Um, just like in case of BT Brinjal, uh, the, this is also a possibility. And if um, CIMIT genetic backgrounds have to be used, for in progressing that BT event. And uh, so that uh, varieties that are suitable for Bangladesh uh, can be developed, then we will be very happy to partner. So it could be a tripartite interface between Bangladesh national system, uh, the technology provider and CIMIT. Uh, and we can formulate this triangular uh, cooperation and uh, do that. But first of all, uh, ministry or someone has to approach uh, the technology provider and uh, seek their interest. And if they are interested to deploy this and uh, especially on a humanitarian uh, basis, that means you can, you don't have to charge very high uh, for, the, the, for the royalty, but if you can reduce it or be very uh, careful about uh, the smallholders, then it becomes all the more useful to deploy them. So. This is something uh, we can partner with you. We are uh, not just on the native genetic resistance side, but also on the transgenic side, but uh, the initiative has to come from, uh, from the ministry. Uh, yeah. Then things will move. Uh, also, uh, right now we have <laughs> many lack of uh, facility, such kind of uh, following um, research activities. Is there any scope that uh, we want artificial inoculation against all armyworm? This kind of uh, uh, initial facility. Uh, if we I think that's manage. very important. Uh, yeah. uh, I think, Tim, uh, you need to touch yeah. base with the USAID Bangladesh mission, uh, yes. whether they can support uh, at least two or three screen houses. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, so that the local germplasm. Uh, could be uh, screened yes, yes, screen. with uh, yes. our germplasm and then breeding for fall armyworm resistance uh, can be initiated. So mm -hmm. it requires um, some, it may not be more than forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to be able to establish a uh, uh, reasonable number of screen houses. Uh, yes. I can provide you the details once uh, uh, the mission expresses uh, it's support. Uh, yes, yes. It is possible. Definitely, it is possible. Yeah, and important yes, also yes, given yes, the yes. number of, of lines, the uh, commercial lines that are available, of which we know yeah. very little about systematically about their potential. Right. Yeah. Yes. So yes, agreed. Yes, um, um, please, team. You consider it in your note. <laughs> At least uh, uh, we can show something to our honorable agriculture minister. Yeah. Because the agriculture minister is very, very supportive to maize yeah. because it is his dream. He wants to expand maize in Bangladesh. <laughs> so I, I hope uh, he will be happy to, if we approach with this uh, some few points, he will be happy. So please uh, take notes. Uh, definitely we will meet with uh, Honorable Agriculture Minister. Excellent. I think I fully support yeah. that. Yes. Um, although the incidents may vary from year to year, uh, it is always good to, over a period of next three, four years, we develop improved maize varieties that are not only heat tolerant, drought tolerant, uh, or uh, disease resistant, but also fall armyworm tolerant. 
Yes. And uh, that would be an added feather to the CIMIT uh, Bangladesh collaboration. Yes, yes, surely. May I, as, as we move closer to end, um, we did have one person with their hand up. I'm not sure if the question still stands, but Mahesh, you had your hand up. Would you like to still pose a question? Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, question is already uh, asked partly by Dr. Israel. Uh, okay. But still, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Prasanna, that's, uh, we are working on fall or we want, especially on hybrids and especially for private sector hybrids. There are any potential hybrids that uh, companies uh, like Bayer and, you know, Monsanto and Syngenta, they have already introduced in this region that have fall no. or resistance. They have no, uh, no resistance. In fact, uh, all the three companies are in discussion with CIMIT right now <laughs> to forge okay, a collaboration okay. on native genetic resistance. Uh, that is our unique strength, Mahesh. Uh, no, yeah, that's... yeah, no other multinational has the germplasm with resistance, native genetic resistance to pollen. Yeah, and then my second question was that uh, till we will get this screen houses and all, this is very important, which is already flagged out by Dr. Israel, but it's possible that we can also do uh, some kind of like in Bangladesh, we have some isolation areas. So if you don't have this, these greenhouses, we can do quickly within isolation areas of yeah, this we, that artificial is possible. screening. That is possible, uh, provided uh, you don't create so much insect pressure that neighboring farmers fields <laughs> <laughs> the, I agree. That's the, raising their arms. <laughs> so as no, in Bangladesh, we, yeah, I, I'm thinking in Bangladesh we have some potential area for maize growing, which is not yet uh, utilized. And then yeah. uh, the only, only thing, like, the only thing, Mahesh, is that it has to be somewhat closer to the insect rearing facility. Okay, uh, okay. it cannot be so distant or hundreds of kilometers away from your research facility where you produce mass rearing of the insect neonate larvae and because remember those neonate larvae has to be transported yeah yeah that's, that's valid well. yeah you have to be that 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 has to be factored in otherwise it can be possible okay that's well taken because uh, otherwise they will not acclimatize with uh, different yeah, the otherwise it will be very difficult you can't transport yeah. hundreds of kilometers and it would take a very long time here as well yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, that's very you know, Thanks, nice and Thanks. informative yeah. presentation. Thank you. Okay. Unless there are any other questions, I think it, we could probably move towards closure. I have not seen more questions coming into the chat. We'll go just. Doctor, uh, Nurul, said Nurul Alam can ask something <laughs> <laughs> because he is one of the best entomologists in Bangladesh as well as in South Asia. So, uh, oh, th um, thank you, Doctor Israel. It's a, yeah. actually uh, this Doctor Poshano's presentation is actually I'm overwhelmed in one sense because. I go back to my ED time because I work this type of post plant resistance things. And really, I totally agree with him. That's why I'm to totally cooked because the polygenic resistance is the best thing for our country yeah. uh, instead of this the BT based resistance. Because uh, you know that our BT brinjal experience is also not so good in one sense. So and at this moment, I don't know that whether our government will be so much uh, uh, take initiative for BT maze. In this, but that's why we should think uh, without any delay about uh, the, this, this native genetic resistance lines, which you have already get to bring it here and start. Uh, this, Excellent. This. I think that's, that's very important. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alam. And I, I think on the mass rearing, there is absolutely no problem. I think you have excellent entomologists. Dr. Alam himself can guide uh, the local scientists. So I have no doubt whatsoever that we can optimize the screening protocol uh, very quickly. Uh, and what is therefore important is to initiate work on uh, a focused breeding work on native genetic resistance uh, to Falami bomb in Bangladesh. 
So if that requires a new project team, so please do uh, let it us does. pay for resource mobilization for at least for three years to begin with so that we can have uh, a targeted work done on this area, introducing best of cement geomplasm. Uh, cement can provide the technical support and uh, so we can, we can have new varieties uh, uh, developed along with other traits that are so relevant for Bangladesh smallholders. Absolutely, and that will be where the future takes us. So I think it's probably useful if we could move towards close, but before everybody goes, if possible, we would very much like to take a group photo of everybody who's participated in listening to the seminar. So if you're willing, I'd like to kindly, kindly request if you could switch on your video and wave hello to the camera. And then we will take a quick group shot of everybody. Well, I could see Amiri Zuman there and- uh, See everyone that you're familiar yeah, with. Shami Mara and so many. I hope Salahuddin is also there too. Ashraful is there. Good. I think uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> So if everyone waves their hand, and then we'll take a nice picture. And then just keep keep your hands up. So we get one more from the next screen because we've got still 44 participants online. Thank you everybody very much. Thank, thank you. Very thank much. you so much, Dr. Hussein, um, Tim, yeah. and Dr. Alam, um, and Sayed Mahmoud, all of you for this excellent interaction and uh, hope to work with you and uh, intensify the work on the Fala Mimam host plant resistance. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. And we will be in touch. Bye. Take care. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Prashanna. See thank you me. in the uh, next time, any other presentation. I am very sure. interested <laughs> in Cornwall. Always, always available, sir. I am expecting good xanthalism, cornwell, high cornwell content xanthalism. Sure, oh. sir. We will have. Uh, <laughs> I, think I am waiting another nice workshop, uh, which will be organized uh, um, uh, next uh, two, three weeks later. So, sure, hope sir. to see you there. Sure, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.